carbon doesn't emit any greenhouse gases. Often glass can be landfilled with less environmental impact than recycling it. Lastly, the global manufacturing trend of lightweighting packaging by using lighter and less materials has caused the recycling ton to evolve. It takes 90% more plastic bottles to make a ton than it did 15 years ago, increasing collection and processing costs. Today, household recycling collections are contaminated with unrecyclable items that can't be processed. A recent survey found that 68.3 million Americans will place an item into a recycling container even if they aren't sure it's recyclable. What impact does this have? Unrecyclable materials increase sorting time, damage recycling equipment, and decrease the value of commodities. Collections are further contaminated by materials that haven't been properly cleaned before being recycled. However, the popularity of recycling continues to grow. An overwhelming 90% of US residents say they want recycling and are willing to pay for it. Maintaining the momentum recycling has gained is more than a matter of economics. Recycling conserves natural resources, saves energy, and reduces pollution. It's simply the right thing to do. To meet public demand, municipalities and republic services must engineer a shift in the current recycling model that is mutually beneficial for everyone. Through collaboration, we can create solutions to make recycling sustainable for our communities. What can you do today? Sort smarter. Proactively educate your community. Learn what materials can and can't be recycled in your community before placing an item in your bin. Make sure all of their items are empty, clean, and dry before placing them into your recycling bins. And finally, encourage them to share recycling knowledge with others. Not everyone is aware of what can be recycled or how it's done. Together, we can change the way we recycle to ensure that recycling remains sustainable for a better world and a brighter future for our blue planet. Learn more at republicservices.com slash recycling reimagined. Recycling has... Okay, so really our message is to, to clean up recycling. And again, it's just by sorting smart and empty, clean, and dry, and then don't bag it. Uh, it needs to be loose. So we're going to be working with, uh, with Jamie on some education material out to the public. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I'd feel free to answer them uh, at this time. We appreciate you coming and giving us that educational piece. Um, I know things like contamination I don't think we realized I mean 25 percent is a pretty high number for for our community and that some people think since the items recyclable if they just put it in the bin that it's fine in fact I we spoke with someone at environmental quality commission who said oh I didn't realize that they have a ketchup bottle you put it in you don't think about maybe rinsing it so you would think that we would but maybe that's just not the mentality or the thinking so we appreciate you bringing that to us and the timing is also good because with the uh, the bins that we had in different places around the community, the drop-off bins going away recently, uh, realizing that that's a nationwide trend and it's not just something that's a Jefferson City issue of not having those bins and that um, kind of the reasons behind that which you're able to explain. So people certainly can still take the recyclables um, to the drop-off facilities at New World or Federal International, or if they're inside the city limits, they have the, uh, the single stream bins. But the key is using that sort smarter thinking of empty, clean, and dry. Yeah, right. So uh, we appreciate that. And maybe thinking before they even get something, uh, kind of pre-cycling necessarily, where if you get a sack, as you're out shopping, do you really need that sack in the first place? Maybe bring a reusable bag so you're not even having to worry about that, uh, where it ends up. But kind of thinking through the item before you even buy it and then where it ends up in the end and the whole cycle of what that is to our city and to our environment and seeing the measures that other cities and communities are taking, such as not having straws or not using bags or having bag fees or those kind of things. 
You mentioned not using bags. Did you mean plastic bags yeah, is like, what you yeah, meant? Yeah. They always, the Walmart bags, the, the grocery store bags, those are not recyclable. Inside so, the bin. Right. Okay. Well, they're not recyclable at all. So you don't need to put your recyclables in them and then put that in a bin. So no, sure. no bags. And some grocery stores collect those, have collection Correct. points, yeah. but maybe Correct. thinking twice before you, before we even take those. And are there other questions of council members on this uh, item? Well, keep us posted as the um, as new uh, initiatives happen and what we can do, and maybe how our recycling rate hopefully is getting uh, better. The contamination rate we want that to go down. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly doesn't help anyone if we make the effort to recycle and then have a contaminated load. So um, appreciate you all being here tonight. And why don't I? Yes, Just Jamie. Real quick, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, here in the next few months, you're going to see from um, Planning and Protective Services, we'll be updating our um, our website to include, you know, these educational videos that we showed tonight, along with uh, doing some more like Facebook or uh, media outreach to get this uh, recycling information out there to the public, and along with other uh, educational materials. So you'll be seeing a lot more information coming out from us soon. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let me get a picture of you all so I can at least post it and remind everybody <laughs> empty, clean, dry, right? Okay, smile. Okay, thank you very much. And we will, we will do our part and challenge those in our wards to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item five, we have a public hearing. And uh, item A, creation of the School Street Local District. Uh, Mrs. Don an ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, establishing a local historic district to be named the School Street Local Historic District and adoption of associated building design requirements. All right, Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this bill would establish a local historic district for the School Street area and adopt building design guidelines for the area. Chapter 8 of the city code authorizes the creation of local historic districts. Start over, lose all the money that's been invested and the time and the energy and the study. And the study that Jenny and th these people are, have been doing is not coming from just Jenny. She may be have her race, but she's working with people of all races. There's all people of all races living in that area that are telling their story. They're interviewing people from all areas from that area. And so I just, I have to speak the truth here and let everybody know what is really going on. Because I know, because I'm working with them and I'm working with a lot of other organizations throughout this group and I can't let, it, let this go without sharing the information. And other people are gonna come and speak. People that live in these areas, you know? And like I said, it disheartens me to see a divide um, of people that I care about. And I care about that church. I was a member of that church for 20 some years. But the bottom line is the church is not at risk. But, and there's ways of working with the church and including the church's history in, uh, in other areas because it's gonna be in that area. And just like Second Christian Church, that history will be included all along that area as we can build together and work together. And we can do that. And we're doing it. The people are doing it and working with organizations that are willing to work with us. Thank you. Any further questions? <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And if anybody would like to come speak, and welcome. Yes. Oh, no, no, I'm fine. No, no, I'm going to get through this. Uh, I have a presentation uh, slide that needs to be put up. Okay, uh, my name is Glover Brown. I'm the executive director of the historic foot in Lafayette Street District. Um, it's just kind of amazing to me to hear all this rhetoric tonight. Uh, we also met with Ms. Smith and her husband uh, over a year and a half ago talking about this area. Uh, we too wanted to be included in 
the conversations with this area and we were excluded. Uh, one of the things that, uh, if you know anything about me, I think all of you have received a copy of a document that I wrote called The Bold New Plan. And I think some of you were at the dedication on Lafayette Street of the memorial plaque that we had installed to not let the memory of Lafayette Street and the Foot District ever be forgotten. If you will remember, in my plan, we talked about enlarging the district ourselves. We were going to do it from uh, Jackson to Clark Avenue, from McCarty to Franklin Street, which was where Lafayette Street originally ended before they built the high school. Uh, the, the slide that you see on the screen now was our attempt to present to the neighborhood a economic development package. Uh, this was brought to the forefront because we looked at the history of Lafayette Street and the uh, commercial district that was destroyed. And so my brother and I, uh, being the executive directors of the organization, we decided that as part of our plan, we were going to put back an economic development package for the neighborhood, the area, and the city as a whole. I heard Mrs. Smith talk about that... Uh, if these homes were lost, you were going to lose uh, property taxes. Well, I think if you look at this structure here, this is going to bring a lot of tax dollars into the city also. And we tried to pick out a structure that was not demonstratively just horrible to the community. We felt we wanted to do something that gives a sense like a bank. It looks solid. It's going to be there for a while, and it's not futuristic. It's something that would, would uh, enhance uh, the community that we're going to put it in. Now, I have met with an economic development team out of St. Louis, and uh, they were sorry that they couldn't be here tonight, but they did give me the instructions to say that we are still in talks with potential developers to provide this, this facade here to that area. Uh, we have spoken to two of the previous presidents of Lincoln University. They have endorsed this project stating that they felt that this would be an economic development package that would benefit the university uh, through providing jobs to its students, uh, providing housing, providing shopping, all within walking distance of the campus. Now, again, we have met with Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, I think we have met with a large number of the council members to share what our plans were for this. And like Quinn Chapel, we wanted to be inclusive in the talks about developing this district and we were excluded and so this is where I'm having a problem now along with Quinn Chapel I don't know could I ask that the screen be put back up showing the boundaries if you look at the map there at the very top is McCarty Street and you see where they oops where they did the indentation to include those homes there on the right side of Lafayette Street. Well, now, if they wanted to talk about the historic significance of the area, if they would have continued east on McCarty Street, three more houses, they would have picked up a house from a very noted civil rights activist that was in the turn of the century. And it was a reverend, I believe it was Sloan, don't quote me on that, but he was very prominent in the black community and to do the civil rights activities back in the early 1900s and the late 1800s. Now, again, like Quinn Chapel, that wasn't included in their historic district. Now, if you go back to the, the testimony that was given, all of these homes are in the floodplain. Yes. They're looking to try to save their investments because of the 50% rule. But I agree with uh, Reverend Gould that I think that this should either be uh, put on the informal calendar or just stopped altogether and let them come back and start over and be more inclusive of what the real purpose of the historic district should be. Uh, we at the Friends of Lafayette Street were not opposed to the historic district by any stretch of the imagination. We would like for them to go back, rethink it, and then include everybody that should be included in that thought process. So that's it for me. Any questions? Councilman Prather? If uh, you were to be included in with this structure, 
would you be able to build I guess would you be able to build the same structure if it was a historic district um, from what I understand from conversations with the potential developers when you have a historic district it's like an onion you're adding more layers to the development process now I just read articles in the paper about this new development that the city is wanting to plan at the MSP area you know this is it's, it can it takes a considerable amount of time and effort to plan these things right now uh, as I said we spoke to mr. And mrs. Smith about a year and a half ago and we shared with them this plan and knowing that we had to go through these processes so uh, like Reverend Gould said we've met with the mayor we've met with uh, mr. And mrs. Smith and Reverend Gould and we've tried to come to some kind of an understanding where that we could all make this a happy happy medium now um, I think a historic district when you look at it you have historic buildings and then you have historic history now the historic buildings of what was really the heart of the black community is gone and can never be brought back so what I'm saying is that as part of the um, executive director of the Friends of Lafayette Street it has always been my intention to bring an economic development package back to that community now myself my family my brother we have nothing we have not a penny invested not a penny to gain we were bringing this back to the community as part of what we feel was what should have been done in the 60s and so what we're doing now is we're offering this to the community and <laughs> I think if you if you look at any area and I think the trend now is for the neighborhood plans I think mr. and mrs. Smith should be delighted that they have a facade like this where they can walk to the corner and go have dinner or where they can go shop and buy a, a gallon of milk whatever they need and so we're not trying to impede upon the historic nature that they want to put there but like Reverend Gould said let's just call a spade a spade let's not look at this fa this facade of we're trying to save the historic nature of the community these people are trying to save their investment dollars so if we if we really could ask for the council um, we feel that it either should be put on the informal calendar and let some more time go by to where all the sides can have conversation or kill it right off the bat and let them go back and start over so that's where I'm at further questions councilwoman Ward hi mr. Brown how are you <laughs> um, are you a current current landowner or property owner in this proposed oh. district no I am not okay so it won't affect you at this point uh, it won't affect me but it will affect the memories of what my mother and father gave their lives up for in trying to have something as I've said in a previous news article as a result of urban renewal we not only lost our legacy our livelihood we lost our homes and so right. this area school street area is the last vestige of property that can be developed by what was then I guess you would say descendants of the original black community so how many how many of those historic structures there on Lafayette would you have to tear down in order to build new development there well uh, 408 which is owned by the city and we think that that would resolve one of the issues that the city has about what to do with 408 and so the other one is the building on the corner which is now an apartment building and we've already had some preliminary discussions with the owners of that building and they have uh, agreed to continue discussions about us purchasing that building for our project and then the building immediately to the west um, we've talked to the owners there so we're only looking at the 408 property and two buildings one on the corner and then the one immediately adjacent to that that's it so three historic structures that contribute to a historic neighborhood I'm sorry I didn't hear that so it would be three historic structures that contribute to an already intact historic neighborhood well that I think if you look at their application uh, the two buildings that we're looking at that are not owned by the city 
were not included as historic buildings in their application. Um, the one on the corner of Lafayette and McCarty, and McCarty. which is that historic duplex. Uh, you know, it's a. I believe it's on there. It's the. It's. I think they have six apartments there. Yeah, I think it has two front doors, or yeah. Okay, okay. and then the one immediately to the west of that. Mm -hmm. Now yeah, we've already within that boundary line. Right. And we've already talked to the owners of those properties, and they have agreed to continue talks on selling those properties for the project. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, now our next uh, speaker. <laughs> Mixed. <laughs> See, we just did opposition. So we just did opposition. So our next speaker, in, are you our next speaker in support? I forgot to clarify that. In support, we're trying to alternate. Okay, that's fine. Come on up. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. I really, really am glad that I, I, I please it. We, we, we'll, uh, oh, we'll, could you give hi. us your name? First for the of all, record, my name Thank is you. Sheila Logan Sims. I am a lifelong resident of Jefferson, the city of Jefferson. I watched them tear down my grandma, grandma Logan's house and put her up on Jackson Street. I watched them tear down my dad's shoe shop and uh, all in the name of urban renewal that all of this was supposed to have been put back together. I watched them move uh, Quinn Chapel uh, from here to there to wherever they wanted it to be. See, I, I remember when Quinn Chapel used to, it was there, they had tent meetings. <laughs> yeah, lifelong resident of Jefferson City. I watched Quinn Chapel build their church there. I watched them do the renovation. They have done everything now you know what they're talking about the, the, I talked to a young lady earlier before the meeting and she was talking about the uh, it was all about the edifice you could look at Quinn Chapel's edifice if they hadn't torn it down okay the city tore it down to put up that uh, that run that exit up to up off of Lafayette Street onto the highway so uh, it's not their fault so I think somewhere uh, in the uh, in their uh, 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 the thing that they're presenting, that there needs to be a, an addendum, okay, an addendum to include Quinn Chapel, and that says it's not their fault that they had to move. That we could have looked at the um, historical value of their edifice if if it w hadn't been torn down to for the uh, improvement of the city of Jefferson. So I think I think we need to, we just need to take a take a take a breath, okay? Just like I, I didn't know if I'm a four or against. I just had something to say. Just say something, you know. I think it take a deep breath, boy, ladies and gentlemen, and and um, and ah, breathe, you know. Breathing is fundamental, okay? Breathing is fundamental. Understand that there's a reason why Quinn Chapels, they, they keep talking about the edifice business of it. You know, uh, uh, mem mem addendum, we are including them because we took their church, the edifice, we took the edifice, but you cannot take the church, the church of the people, okay? And the people have, have remained the same. They have moved according to the improvement of the city of Jefferson. That's not their fault. Do not punish them for that. Uh, nobody needs to have a spank in the night, okay? <laughs> we don't need to spank anybody, okay? Just understand that the, uh, somewhere there needs to be an addendum that says, yes, we are going to include them because their edifice was torn down for the improvement of the city of Jefferson and allow them to be included in that. Allow them to do that. And that's, and that's you know, I, I just want everybody you know, to be on the same page. And sometimes, like I said, it takes a deep breath. Everybody breathe. Ah, let it out. 
good things in, bad stuff out. Okay, breathe. You know, and and and, and mm, be careful about the I me mean, my thing going on. Okay, watch out, I me mean, my. Okay, because I me mean, my will get you in trouble every time. All we're saying is, all I'm saying. I don't know what everybody has to say because I'm just standing by myself. But all I'm saying is that allow Quinn Chapel addendum. They make addendums all the time. How many addendums do we have to the Constitution? Hello? A bunch. A bunch. Because somebody changed their mind and somebody said, oops, we forgot that. Oops. We have a oops. Hi, Madam President, we have a oops. Madam, I made you, Terry, I just made you the president. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Madam Mayor, we have, we have a oops going on. We have a oops, and we can fix a oops without anybody's feelings being hurt. You know, just say, get off, get off of it. That that, that business about the the structure is not uh, is not in line with the other historical structures. Because if, if now if the city of Jefferson had gone through all the challenges of lifting up that church and putting it on that other corner, guess what? <laughs> the their structure would have been the like their structure. They tell me my time is up. You know I could talk forever, but Thank anyway, you. addendum. Thank you very much. Addendum. All right. Are y'all breathing? Breathe. All right. Okay. So next speaker, please. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Turgeon, members of the City Council. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Mary Chance. I live at 1928 Hazleton. And I'm the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, your HPC considered the application for the School Street Local Historic District. We held a public informational meeting and a public hearing about the proposal. And after due consideration, the Historic Preservation Commission approved the application for the local historic district. Um, as this was a first time process for, a, for the city and for us, certainly, uh, we took special care to assure that the application was given full consideration. Um, we did deliberate, thoughtful consideration, and we felt the importance of our role. This was the first time this was a very important step. After the process had been completed, the Historic Preservation Commission felt that the application had indeed met, in fact more than met, the requirements to be approved as our very first local historic district and voted to approve the application. I'm sure that each one of the members of the commission had their own special reason for, you know, listening to the testimony and, and their thought things that stuck out to them, but I just wanted to share with you a few of the things that stuck out to me in the process. Um, first off was the extent of the history of the people of the neighborhood, of the contribution of that neighborhood to the community, not just to the community, but in many times to the state of Missouri and to our nation from the people who live there. Second was the testimony of many of the people that came to testify in support of the application who had actually lived there as children lived in that neighborhood, some had returned and talked about the significance of that neighborhood and what it had meant to them. And then third, that impressed me, were two reports that had been commissioned by the City Council, one in 1992 and one in 1995 by the Urbana Group, one looking at South Side and one looking at East Side. And in both reports, um, throughout the reports, they were, they were looking, I believe, just to determine structures that would meet the definition for a historic, National Historical Register. Um, but throughout those reports, the Urbana Group said to the city of Jefferson um, a few things that, I, I, that struck me with this. One was that the national, being on the National Register does not protect a historic resource. Uh, that a local historic district is the only way really to protect the historic neighborhood. Um, they talked a little bit about the review, the design review, but then they went on and they gave some examples in, I believe, the 1992 report where they talked about examples of had Jefferson City at the time had some kind of a local historic district or established something, some of uh, the neighborhoods that we drive by every day wouldn't look the way they do today. And they gave specific examples of the 900 block of, 
on the east side of Jefferson Street, uh, Madison Street, and then on East Elm where infill was buildings that were just um, not necessarily um, historic in nature. So th that impressed me, but most imp I think mostly on those reports, the thing that Im impressed me was that um, a local designation is the only way to protect the character of a historic neighborhood, and they specifically cited School Street as an excellent example of an area which probably does not retain enough integrity to be included in the National Register, but which retains the charming character which the city may want to protect. So this was in 1990, that was out of the 1995 re report. Um, this is a special first local historic district. I think the standard uh, for this application, the quality of the research and the application has set a good standard from which we can continue in the future. It will pave a way for many other new districts um, in the city to rise up. And with that, um, I would encourage you to support the um, application for the School Street Local Historic District. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, service to the commission as well uh, its volunteers and we appreciate all your time on that are there any questions uh, councilman Fitzwater thank you. Mike, um, thank you very much for being here and I understand this has been a, a grueling process unfortunately I couldn't be there that night I tried to get there but I had yeah. other conflicts I couldn't get there so I appreciate the work but I have gone the staff has done a great job of sending us a lot of documentation so I've tried to spend a lot of time on this issue and just had a, a couple questions I've gone through the minutes uh, of that meeting and I think it started with staff giving their presentation which I think mr. Barron indicated that their recommendation at the end of the process I think we showed there was a 4-2 vote is that accurate that's correct so did one member not vote I, I believe that, one member either were one member short or one member was not there that night Jamie I have to look to you she left because it shows seven members there so oh, oh the <coughs> chair does not vote okay. unless it's a tie I'm sorry duh the the folks that testified Miss Smith opened it up there was a question raised in regard to the FEMA issue have you all been able to dig into that because I know we've gotten direction both ways we've got correspondence in regard to that issue have you been able to the Historic Preservation Commission has not. I know the staff testified that night, and I believe subsequently I have seen communications between FEMA and um, the uh, applicant and the city about the what would happen if the local historic designation was given in terms of would it would the 50% rule no longer apply? But I'm not an expert on that, um, so. I, um, Mr. Fitzwater, I really can't answer the question other than to say there has been communication uh, with both the applicant and the city that has come back and forth between them and FEMA. There was a reference made tonight that there's a waiver That's process. Correct. Has anybody in, does that have to be done after the historic district or could they ap apply for the waiver now? Again, you're outside of my expertise. I'm, I apologize. Okay. I know there's somebody here tonight that can answer that question. And then Mr. Han Hernandez raised the issue in regard to the 50% substantial improvement rule, which, which we've mm -hmm. been aware of. Ms. Beatham, who's kind of led the, kind of some of the discussions and talked about, and Mr. Hernandez and Ms. Beatham talked about the fact that there are not a lot of owner-occupied properties in that area. area. Mm -hmm. I think he quoted 80%, she quoted 20, 80% were not so it'd be 20% were owner occupied, 25% right. is right. what Ms. Beatham said. Did that raise any comment from the story? It did not. It, to my recollection, there was, we heard those statistics, but it did not raise any particular alarm or concern. And then Dr. Gould was there. This meeting was on May the 1st, Correct. and the comment that they <coughs> reflected in the minutes was she had requested the matter be put on hold so the more people could weigh into the matter to see what was feasible for the area was that taken into consideration as part of the well certainly um, the Commission could have I suppose done that but there was a motion made and seconded that the uh, district be approved uh, and the motion passed 
So m my point is the request mm -hmm. she made tonight was made on May the 1st, and now we're at council yeah. two months later yeah. Yeah. addressing and basically the same request. Right. And I have to be honest with you, um, I don't know for certain, but I'm not certain that it is within the Historic Preservation Commission's purview to make a determination like that. I think that would be something that would be more for the City Council unless the applicant withdrew their uh, application. Again, I'm not, you know, I'm not an attorney, but it just, yeah, it just seems like our role was to look at the historic aspect of this application and did it meet the criteria I believe there are 10 or 11 criteria that have to be met and because your historic preservation commission are people that have expertise and knowledge on historic issues and so they were kind of I think the historic preservation commission gets that job to determine is there a historic value in what's before us just like on demolitions when we make a decision on can an ap applicant for a demolition of a home over a hundred years we look at the historic nature make a determination and so I think that what we were looking at was was the criteria met that the applicant was asked to meet and in the opinion of the majority of the members it was but so you don't have a mechanism I mean we have informal calendar I realize you don't have no. as structured a mechanism right. Right. and then it's all it also quotes as mr. Brown indicated he, he had asked for the same thing to delay the decision until more folks could be brought into the decision making process so again now a couple months later we're hearing the same same request from mr. Mm -hmm. Brown and then quote some other folks who were both for and against and then getting back to the staff recommendation with a four to two vote meaning there's only a one vote swing really I mean, if one vote would have went the other way it would have right. been a three to three that did not raise any concern with the commission with all the testimony with the staff recommendation that maybe a delay would be um, it, it really it, ne it did not come up when the application uh, when the vote was taken and it was approved we we moved on I think that um, you know you always wish that the decisions were unanimous I um, mean that that's a perfect world it wasn't um, so but no there was not we didn't they we didn't like come back and say well maybe we should rethink this or maybe we should because the vote was four to two on demolition applications we will have uh, not major excuse me not unanimous decisions sometimes usually those are sometimes it's good to have folks on the opposite side that's true as a mayor indicated I appreciate it. I, I'm not trying to grill you I'm just no trying no to get that's to the fine bottom because yeah. there's obviously a big difference of opinion on how folks think we ought to proceed and yeah, I just yep. want to make sure that we have the information. So yep. Thank you. I understand. Ma thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Councilman Ward? Um, I'd like to have the, our city councilor kind of respond to some of those questions. I know that uh, the Historic Preservation Commission on another topic, uh, was it 408, when 408 came to that. you guys? Um, you had, they, that was their desire to um, delay. delay it and um, they were instructed by could not. the counselor that they that they could not do that by their their bylaws and, and their ordinance so when, with something like this would that have been I think it was just their take that they do have to vote on issues that do come to them when they do right the uh, the code that uh, chapter 8 um, 8047 uh, sub 4 requires that the, the that the um, historic preservation commission actually take up vote only the applicant is eligible to ask for a continuance in writing and so absent that um, that request in writing from the applicant to to for a continuance the board really or the commission doesn't have any authority to grant a, a continuance on their own motion okay thank you very thank much you. So our next speaker, welcome. Good evening. My name's Perry Douglas, and I'm a member of that little church on the foot. I first came to Jefferson City in 1947. The first thing my parents did was take my brother and I over on Miller Street and join Quinn Chapel AME Church. 
it bewilders me that we, the, even the thought of us not being included in a historic movement such as this. It's a little modern church at 415, but if you look on the roof, that steeple came from the church on the foot down at 529. If you go in our doors, there's stained glass windows that came from that little church on the foot at 529 Lafayette. If you look a little further, you'll see columns that came from the front porch of the little church on the foot. We don't want to be forgotten historically. I'm in no way opposed to historic movements but I am opposed to my church being overlooked or forgotten. All we want to do is to be a part of a historic movement. Thank you. Thank you, any questions? All right. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. My name is Jocelyn King, 901 Rolling Court, Jefferson City, Missouri. Hello to all of you. Um, this is getting to be emotional here. Um, my family has been a part of this community since 1970. Both of my parents at Lincoln University a long time. I went to Jeff City High School. I left for a long time and came back. Um, Quinn Chapel's always been here. When I first came to town, I was asked if that was where I'm going to church. Um, Unfortunately, I said no only because I'm a part of a different denomination, but I've heard so many wonderful things about Quinn Chapel over the years. When I first saw the notice of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and I was at that meeting last month, why did I go? It was talking about making everything green space. You know, this neighborhood, green space. Now, I have to give it to you. I love the greenway system going through the town. Uh, I walk my dog a mile a day. But we don't need any more parkland and green space and greenway right here. We need this community and the people. And there are some people who don't have things quite as pleasant as they should be because they're in the floodplain. You know, there are certain things that they cannot do with their homes. If, you know, it really gets bad and they try to move, they can't really get out of the home what they put into the home. And this could be my family because when we first moved here, we were on Lafayette right in the floodplain, but it was just due to other uh, circumstances and logistics that we had to move, and we moved just right around the corner to Roland Court. So that's why I was here. I did not want to see just gradually green space develop, which is very conceivable if these homeowners have to live with the floodplain rule and not be able to get their investment of what they've done, the money that's needed to make repairs. There are so many of us who were victimized by the windstorms that came through here. Tore up my backyard, another neighbor tore the roof off, and this had nothing to do with the floodplain. When it comes to getting money to fix these things, that's where it comes in. So I would like to see the neighborhood spared for that reason and included in the historic district. If this proceeds now and Quinn Chapel is not included, I don't look that at that as overlook. I don't look at that as abandonment because when you are a part of this community, you have a love for everything in it. Lincoln University, Quinn Chapel, and everything else, okay? I look at it as a building stone, okay? If we can't get the whole thing right now, 
let's start with what we got okay uh, Ms. Smith you know put a lot of work into this and it may not have been the same thoughts of everybody else but there is a thing where it helps us and it helps us all to have this historic district and I don't want any more green space that's number one number two my father the Lutheran pastor so I understand some other things too I understand when one door opens or closes rather another door can open if the door closes with this chapter with only this chapter of the historic district the door is not closed there is another door that will open ask and it shall be given seek and ye shall find knock and the door will be open unto you and you know sometimes we have to knock and knock and knock we have to be creative we have to find new resources but the door is not closed uh, one other little comment I wanted to make for 20 years my father was pastor at a church I bet nobody's heard of in here but it was just about 20 miles down the road Pilgrim Lutheran Church in Freedom Missouri Freedom is like a little suburb of Lynn that was named Freedom right after the Civil War they are this year celebrating 150 years they've been through many obstacles they've been through growth they've been through growing pains but they not only celebrated 150 years but it was something very unusual I could not believe I was not a part of the celebration there by the way but the members there who still know us kept us informed on May 27th, the weekend of Memorial Day, the editorial page, I've never seen anything like this. It was a big color cartoon picture of the church. Pilgrim Lutheran Church celebrates 150 years. Who has ever seen that, okay? And it told a bit about its history. I bring this out because that church has never been a part of a historic district per se but it is still historical Quinn Chapel will always be the historical pinnacle of this community I can appreciate a lot of buildings built after the Civil War and I have a greater appreciation for those built during and before the Civil War and survived and I'm you know I'm just talk about that because you know I mean that's just something close to my heart and Quinn is part of this community so Quinn is a part of our love everybody in this room but if this is approved this historical district as it is to help some of our brothers and sisters in this community to help their living and in my estimation keep away the green space okay. thank you thank you very much i don't want to cut anyone off but i know we've gone beyond but, a little well beyond so idea. i want to make sure we keep it moving and I, so. thank you for your thank time you. thank you and our next speaker please thank you and if council has any questions just i'll i'll let y'all just raise your hand or speak up if you do thank you <coughs> welcome Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Sherilyn Woodruff, and I don't want to be redundant, but I do want to say that I am a lifelong member of Jefferson City. I have been in the community 74 years. I am one of the two parishioners that have been at all three locations. We first uh, had to move, as we've heard over and over tonight, from Miller Street. I was 12 when we moved to 529 Lafayette. 
and we would still be there had it not been for the relocation to our new facility. All I want to say tonight is that we are not opposed to this uh, School Street Historical uh, District, but we would like our heritage, our uh, legacy to be included in this district. We want to continue to be recognized for the work that we have done in the community, the spiritual work we've done, the um, just to be included. We're not opposed to the district that has been approved, not approved, but proposed. But please just give us some consideration and just take time to look at our perspective, please. Thank you. Welcome. Madam Mayor and the City Council. My name is Tammy Beshin and I live at 728 Deer Creek Road in Jefferson City. I'm also the president of the Historic City of Jefferson. Um, I sent by email a letter which each of you should have received including the mayor uh, about uh, the thoughts from Historic City of Jefferson and so you should have those in your possession but I would like to just reiterate a section of that uh, that I wrote to you. Um, <clears throat> the Historic City of Jefferson supports the creation of this local historic district uh, and in particular uh, I ask that you consider the following those who own property in this area want this designation including the design guidelines and 75 per and that is shown because 75 percent of these owners including including the mayor on behalf of 408 Lafayette Street with the city owned uh, owns signed the petitions for such Secondly, the written and verbal comments submitted by the public for the Historic Preservation Commission in May and the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting in June and what I've heard tonight uh, overwhelming, overwhelmingly support this designation. The question may be the um, boundaries, but the support for a district like this, for this district in particular, is there from the public. The city holds certified local government or CLG status, which was created to help communities save the irreplaceable historic character of places, a certification that requires local government to demonstrate their commitment to historic to their commitment to historic preservation in order to be eligible for certain funding along with other benefits. And fourth, the city staff had already been directed to revise the local historic district criteria to make the process easier for applications and the acceptance of applications. So to go through this process uh, has been very tedious and very draining and very resource, uh, eat, eating up a lot of resources to even get to this point with the current uh, regulations that are in place with the city code uh, right now. So with those um, considerations, uh, I would ask that you vote in favor of Bill 2018-021 tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. I won't be long. My name is Lori Sims, and I am another lifelong member of Quinn Chapel and I am on the Board of Trustees for the building for the church my parents moved here in 1958 and while I was born here I never experienced the business district on Lafayette that you've heard other people talk about because by the time I was old enough to know what was going on it was gone there were hotels there were grocery stores I don't know where Mr. Perry went and Miss Sherry they could tell you all of the things that were in that very vibrant striving 
district. It's all gone. It was supposed to come back after urban renewal. That was the agreement the city made. And the only business that is still there is Carolyn Johnson's barber and beauty shop. Because her father threatened to sue the city if they didn't give it back. Everything that I've heard today preserves buildings, not history. And while it is very important that we find a way to help these property owners, I feel for them being in a floodplain with all the restrictions that are upon them, nothing that I've heard said that there's any guarantee that this district will help them. The applicants say that this is going to revitalize the area, but nobody has said how. Nobody has spoken to any economic development just preserving these buildings and calling it a historic district. And I will just be honest, because I don't know how to do anything but be blunt. Given the history of Jefferson City, when it comes to the historic black neighborhoods, I have no confidence that this will actually benefit us. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Any other speakers this evening? Welcome. Madam Mayor and uh, Council. Uh, I've been in every public hearing we've had here, and I've heard all of the comments all along. And I've been in, uh, as uh, Mr. Brown says, conversations with him for some time. And we met at least on one occasion at Quinn Chapel. And it's apparent that we're not all going to agree with what was discussed in those meetings, but the first time I heard the word inclusion was at the P&Z meeting uh, last month. I did hear that people were being excluded, and I was at a meeting at Quinn Chapel with the mayor and Mr. Sanders, and we primarily talked about the economic development plan. And there were two developers there from Ferguson that were brought in to t talk about that. And that has been the focus of all the discussions in the past. It hasn't been about, please include us. So I just want to say that's my recollection. And some of you were there, at least at that meeting. And if you attended the three meetings that were held in this building, you didn't hear the word inclusion. You heard, stop it. Let's think it over. Uh, I've got a plan. I want to present to the city. That's what we heard up until the last meeting at PNC. So does Jefferson City want a local historic district? That You're going to decide that tonight. The opponents of the historic district uh, don't really want this district. And failure, failure to approve this district will, in my opinion, uh, seriously damage any chances for a future historic district in this city. I did a quick survey and called around today. Uh, I excluded Kansas City and St. Louis. But uh, Springfield has three local historic districts like the one that's being proposed here. Cape Girardeau has one. Uh, Popular Bluff has one. <laughs> and Columbia has five such districts to protect historic buildings. If you, you really can't, if you would prefer to have a plaque down there next to the tennis courts versus buildings that uh, actually would be maintained and keep the integrity of, of a neighborhood that once existed, then maybe a plaque's all we're going to get out of this down the road. But that's not what I want. The school street request meets all requirements set out in the city ordinances, sections 844 to 846, to form a local historic district. And if you exclude the five properties owned by government, 90% of the property owners signed the petition. The HPC approved the historic district, as you heard, and approved the design guidelines. Planning and zoning was invited to completely review the process again uh, last month. And they took a neutral stance because they didn't sound like they really wanted to make a decision on it. Um, so 
there's been a lot of opposition at every step of the way in this process, even before we began to gather signatures. But a local historic district has many benefits, and this is about property and it's about preservation. But most of the school street properties are in the floodplain, and it's hard to maintain and preserve such properties in America. So I invite you to read your own city forms, number 200 and 204, which explain how the federal, state, and city governments impose rules on private property owners in floodplains. <laughs> in paragraph one, it clearly states the rules are a hidden cost that actually reduces the value of the structures. And no owner in this district bought any of these properties knowing any of that at all before they bought the property. And in form number 200, it clearly states this information is actually mostly learned after the fact by a property owner after they buy the property. One commissioner at the PNZ meeting said he felt the applicants were trying to circumvent federal FEMA rules, but that's not really true. Uh, in 2008, there's a, there's a 2008 uh, FEMA publication entitled Floodplain Management Requirements that Provide Relief for Historic Structures. It sets out the rules. It's not vague. And in your packet on May 29th, uh, the city administrator sent a letter to the State Historic District Preservation Office officer requesting clarification on this point. Can a certified local government, such as Jefferson City, allow relief as described in the 2008 FEMA publication I just cited? So we've talked with city, state, and FEMA officials since the PNZ meeting. No one rule uh, will fit all of these properties. I hope to work if, if you approve this, I hope to work on a couple of test cases, but it's not a one-size-fits-all. And one approach described in the FEMA rule is that a property owner will apply for a variance. He will go to your floodplain manager and he will say, I want to do this, and he will also go to the HPC and show his plans. Two separate processes. So if we approve a school street local historic district, it's a good first step and additional districts could be built off of that. So I hope we can get this done. Thank you, any questions? Okay, thank you. Welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Arthur Brown. I live at 714 Clark Avenue. In so those are things I think we can look at because I, I think it's evident after going through this one that there might maybe things that could be made better for the future. So I would look to city staff to give us some guidance on what those things could be. Um, looking at uh, dollars and and we knew that we had that that looming over us and so we knew that we had to act. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have had to have the vote and have the five to five and have the mayor act to break that tie. So we've had other things um, that make this unique. But the fact that it's unique, I think, can also make it better in the long run, but it also makes it harder as we're moving through this. It's not, there's not a clear path. There's not a clear um, vision. But I think the clearest vision is I, I don't hear anyone saying they want to see green space. So out of the 5-5 vote to demolish that particular property, it went to Historic Preservation Commission. We knew that that allowed a 60-day extension. We knew that this would get it out in the media. It would get it out to the public. Maybe somebody would want to buy that property. It's not necessarily for sale. It was for sale. Uh, we didn't have interested buyers. So we're just trying to revive interest that maybe somebody would want to, whether it's a neighbor, uh, a citizen, a property owner who already lives there, somebody who could convince somebody of the, the value of buying that property or perhaps as as mr brown mentioned a developer would want to come in and, and make that purchase so at the meeting at quinn chapel that was something i really stressed is the importance of please help find a buyer if there's a buyer and there's an interested party then perhaps we could talk to council and maybe we would be able to work with somebody because we know we have a bill or an invoice that could be hanging over us and if there's interest in in buying that so that it wouldn't become a green space so all that being said, ultimately finding someone to buy it would, would be a solution so that it wouldn't be green space. Um, that's the background. Uh, after hearing all the testimony this evening and knowing that there is no clear consensus um, that among the property owners and really among the community, 
Um, if I were asked to to vote, if it were again a split five to five, I want to let council know that I would vote no um, for uh, moving forward with the historic designation at this time. And I want to make clear that that does not mean I don't value the amount of time that went into planning this historic district. Um, I just feel that it needs, um, I would not want to move forward with something that is that doesn't have any consensus at this time. Even planning and zoning did not give any direction or recommendation. They remain neutral uh, on their recommendation. So uh, looking at solutions, I want to be open to council's suggestions this evening. Perhaps uh, a suggestion could be made to city staff that at the next meeting a resolution could come forward that would give staff some direction on how to proceed on historic preservation efforts to have a positive impact on the preservation plan to preserve areas in our community and give staff that direction so they know that it is a priority for the city council then all and also updating the process for historic designation since it is updated it's been many years in fact decades since it was in first in, put in place and that the city is lacking tools to make it successful and it makes it a burden on property owners I think if we knew that ahead of time I, I think that that's what has brought that out so I wouldn't want to say well you shouldn't have tried in the first place I think that's what has come out of this period so the effort hasn't certainly not been lost um, and in the end the question that Jenny asked at the podium Mrs. Smith can they change can the city change the boundaries to include that and I think that's something council would want to know as well so I would pose the question to staff if we can change the boundaries and also like to open it up and, and uh, not and, and hear from council. So, Councilman Hensley. Thank you. I have I have a question actually of Reverend Gould, if that's all right, or of, uh, or of anyone from Quinn Chapel. It's it's specific to the issue that you just mentioned. Uh, I'll just I'll just pose the question. If if anyone knows, they can answer. Uh, does Quinn Chapel and the parking lots behind it? I'm I'm looking at the aerial shot. Is that all one single parcel? So they were not unified into a single parcel right. after you purchase. Yeah. Does the does the building itself sit on one single parcel? And, and just to make sure one more time, even through all the development process, and the building currently sets across four different parcels? Correct. Okay. Well, yeah, the building specifically sits across four, actually, technically, the building probably sits across five because there was, uh, there, no, uh, there was a building there on the corner of Miller and Lafayette as well, probably 701. So the building actually is across five pieces of property. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Councilman Fitzwater. Uh, well, I guess if first if we could get a response from council on your question in regard to can they amend <coughs> the application or does it start over? And then Mr. Melman responded when I raised a question in regard to could they delay it, could it Commission delay it that night, and the answer was no. Do they have the ability, or do we have the ability to ask them to amend it after the fact? And especially since that request is coming from the applicant. So, what would be that answer, Mr. Molman? Which one shall I address first? But either one. Okay. Um, procedurally, the. Uh, the rules that govern these types of applications in front of the uh, Historic Preservation Commission appear to also um, also govern the City Council and so I would say the same thing that the applicant has a right to a continuance um, but the City Council does not have uh, the authority to grant a continuance on its own motion and um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep up here as we go along so if I if I've 
said something different to you uh, previously, uh, I, I apologize. Um, however, in our charter, the charter includes provisions that bills may be uh, placed on the informal calendar. Charter authority trumps city code, and so the the, the city council, the bill sponsor's uh, ability to place something on the informal calendar, is unfettered, even in light of this of this uh, rule contained in the code. So, so the bill sponsor can still place it on the informal calendar. Um, as far as amending the district, um, I have previously, and I continue to take a position. Uh, that uh, once the application is received by the city that the uh, that the application can't be amended uh, particularly can can't. particularly by the City Council the you're saying cannot cannot be amended okay. Thank you. Um, the City Council the the City Code sets this up to be a property owner driven application um, initiated by property owners and does not give the city a City Council or the city authority to start this process and so therefore the city council corollarily should not be able to have the ability to amend the application itself and so that that's why I take this position I will say this is a it's a it, the procedures are are really really poorly set forth in the in the lo local historic uh, district ordinance it's 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 really a disservice to to the applicants and to the city under the rules that we're working on and so this is a this is a not a direct answer out of the city code but it's an interpretation that i have to make based on what i believe the city code is trying to do so what does city code directly say city code says 75 percent of 75 percent of the property owners in a proposed district have to approve have to sign on to a petition to to uh to uh to establish a, um, a historic district is there any wording there about amending it, there is no wording about amending so if there's not then what prohibits it <clears throat> so once again this this is a hole in the code and so I'm, I'm forced to make an interpretation my interpretation is that when someone signs a petition that is that is circulated by a petitioner they are uh, approving what is contained within that petition at the time that they signed it and so um, if a property is added that is a property that was not in front of a applicant um, as part of the proposed district when they sign the application and you cannot make an assumption that the person would have signed that application with uh, if that property was included now that's it could be reasonable to infer that but legally you can't make that inference that, well, that makes, that makes an assumption on on mm -hmm. a property owner um, on a property owner signatory that that they would have signed it had it included that additional property. Okay, and I I know we have two hands. I saw Prather before and then Hensley. So why don't we do that? So if we uh, amended to add them pending their approval for the application, their percentage would that work? Well, it it, it 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 addresses one part of the problem. It doesn't address the second part of the problem. The other 22 property owners who signed the petition in a particular shape, and and that's what I was trying to get at. You cannot you cannot make the assumption that those property owners would have signed that petition had the shape been different. And if they did sign a petition to change it, then then we would be then we, we so would. So basically, be what you're saying is, if we did something like that approved it pending both uh, Quinn Chapel's approval and the the other owners signing the the petition to amend it would be okay it's there's no authority in the code for that but I, I it kind of it passes the test the task it passes the kind of fundamental fairness test so yeah I think the City Council could could do that thank you. Councilman Hensley and then uh, Fitzwater thank you um, the signing of the petition does that go beyond simply agreeing to have your discrete parcel included in the district or does it also um, grant some power over the final shape of the district I mean, do, does does my signing that also give me permission to attempt to exclude other people from being within the district who would like to be don't my property rights like stop 
at the boundaries of my property? Cor correct. It's it, it the idea is that this is a collective application, <coughs> and and you can only judge the application on 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 the application that was in front of the voter or the the signer at the time he signed it. Um, that's that's kind of the central idea, and if that could be used to exclude other people, I I guess that's a way you can frame it. But uh, the the way the way I I'm forcing myself to look at it is that you're essentially you're asking a property owner to answer a question do you want to be part of this historic district that ha looks like this and when they sign it they say yes and that that question did not include can we add some additional property to, as well isn't the central question i'm sorry to jump in isn't the central question though for each property owner whether they consent to having their property encumbered by the rules that go along with being a historic district i th i think it's a central question i don't know if it's the only question okay. thank you councilman fitzwater M my question relates to councilman prathers if if we cannot infer that a property owner added we'd have to go back and ask everyone's opinion can we also and in not infer that the historic Pr preservation commission would approve that application being changed since it was a 4-2 vote I mean it's going to look much different to the two that voted against it and maybe to one other person um, that's an that's that's a great question um, ultimately the City Council is the ultimate decision maker and the um, and the uh, the uh, historic preservation is is essentially a recommending body and so um, I, I think ultimately the city council's decision on this um, would, uh, would, would be the final decision that you wouldn't have to refer it back to the HPC to, to take action. Um, I, I, I can tell you point blank, this is, this is going on trying to interpret what is in a very sparse code and could leave us to open t to exposure for challenge on either side um, you know it's there's there's no real clear direction on on what the right answer is councilman Hesse I want to pick up where councilman Hensley left off though just for clarity's sake I'm, I'm looking at the application and I'm looking at the form that each individual property owner signs and that form talks about designation requires 75 percent um, it talks about that it would enact building design standards contained within the code here. But I guess I'm curious, are the property owners at any point in time shown a map to say these are the 28 properties? Are they told, like, what is the boundaries? Are they simply asked, we would like you to be included, would you sign off on this? Because I would argue that if they're just asked if they want to be included in a historic district then that person's not signing based off of anything in front of them that dictates they're one of 28 properties um, because the process it seems to be the process could be fluid and would be designed in case there's a 29th that comes along um, in fact i do believe we started with 27 and then came to the conclusion there actually was a 28th and I think the applicant simply went and got one extra signature to hit that threshold. They didn't go out and get everybody else to sign once more to say, well, we were wrong, there was 28. I believe, I believe that was pre-application or, or at least, or at least um, pre-final submittal. So I, 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 mean, I, I don't, I don't, I yeah. don't know the process and, and, um, and, it is is a is a theory that makes sense i, I recognize yeah. that um I, I i i don't think that that is the correct answer that if they weren't shown a map um that they should have been um i, I think that is part of the question of not only do you want to have be a part of a zone but here's what the zone is yeah Mr. Is it, i'm sorry my oh. follow-up real quick would just be if if after a historic district is created and you you head down the path years down the road 
what's the process then to add additional properties to that district if there is said process you'd have to infer a process um, a, a static district doesn't make any sense under state uh, under state zoning law um, and this is it's a land use law um, what I would suggest is that the code needs to get amended and add it because it's just it's a giant hole in the code so a path here could be the approval of the district as it stands before us with the recognition or we pass a motion resolution whatever it takes to say if the desire of the council is to add uh, the Quinn Chapel property I looked it up on the GIS map based off of Councilman Hensley's questions and it looks like on the GIS map that it, it's listed as one parcel now maybe it was broken up more before but it shows as one now um, that we could change our code or create that process immediately and now it's not immediate answer tonight but it could give us the chance to add them by a process we determine in the future here to reach some sort of consensus and resolution this evening would that be something you think is plausible or are we playing with fire no i think that'd be okay. fine i think that'd be well within the city council's right. uh, ability to control all right thank you mr Cole. I was just going to say the um, the public hearing though does specify the number of lots and has the um, actual district identified. All the public notices for the various public hearings. And that's announcements. that's correct. So. Uh, Councilman Graham, did you have your hand up? I guess my question is for uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, going back to the original application, uh, did that ap did application have a drawing of a map, or how was that application set up? Councilman Graham, I should probably have Mrs. Smith come to the speaker and I probably should have done that with Mrs. Gould earlier too okay. because if with um, could you come to the the mic so we're talking about the original application and how it was, it was sent out to the property owners how was that sent out was it sent out as a drawing of a map or was it just saying that these properties to this street how was the application set up prior to uh we beginning the process we had a, a neighborhood meeting and we had maps and we showed the residents the maps and uh, when we de developed all the parts of the application and began collecting signatures um, we emailed to those applicants that we had emailed addresses for which were most of the residents or most of the property owners um, the the map that was emailed and when we went to get signatures personally because every one of those had to be notarized mm -hmm. and most of them are individual app, uh, signature pages uh, we gave them a copy of the design guidelines we did not show them a copy of the map but um, I think they were all aware of the um, of the boundaries but not you know I don't think anybody asked specifics they had seen the maps but I didn't I didn't show them a copy of them every time they got a signature mr. Kroll I was just gonna say I'm looking at the application and page 70 I just lost it page 70 looks like it has a school district historic map that outlines in blue what appear to be what we've been talking about so it, unless I'm not understanding that correctly it looks like there was a a map area designated yes there was but okay. I think the bigger question is the what you're looking at that application was submitted after we had collected all the signatures so I had to have that in okay you know when they when they signed the the application and they didn't they didn't always have a phys I did not put a physical map in front of them it was kind of understood what the the boundaries were but the bigger thing were was the design guidelines that were spelled out because that's that's the bigger question for the property owners so you're saying um, mr. Molman that a yes vote would oh and I apologize is anything else for Kathy or Jenny oh my gosh sorry um, oh I'm sorry yes uh, mr. Hensley councilman Hensley 
Good evening. Thank you. Um, this is to follow up on something I think you said during your closing rebuttal a little while ago, that if we could find a way to get uh, Quinn Chapel's property into this, uh, that you would not object to that. Not at all. Just to follow up on that, if we had to uh, delay briefly for a number of weeks uh, to figure out the correct language to make that happen and to get it done, would that be a problem for you? No. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. What? So if, uh, oh, Councilman Graham. So would that delay be on the informal calendar or how would that be delayed? I, I suppose so, yeah. For the informal calendar? Okay. Councilman uh, Mahalo, uh, Fitzwater, <laughs> sorry. Got to follow up, I'm not picking on our council. But with the comment you made in regard to the changing the size of this and with the city being a land owner, owner in that district, if, well, one, I'm trying to get a, an update on where 408 stands right now, so that's kind of the first part of the question. Second part, if we become the disgruntled landowner because of some significant negative consequence to the city, does that pose any problems for us until we get these kind of things ironed out? So I guess the first part is, what's the current status? I mean, I know we got turned down on the demolition. You know, what, what's the current status? And what's the impact if we become the disgruntled landowner at some point, if things are changed from what we got back? Um, I have to refer to Mr. Stander Sanders on this current status of a um, of 408. Um, I guess I guess I'm sorry if I'm being dense, but I I disgruntled by whom? Well, if if we go ahead and approve an expanded district that, as you indicated, I mean it could come back from the commission, and we disagree with them and change the size of it and say, you know, thanks for your work. I'm guessing if they were to come back with a two against two four four against, we wouldn't even be in this discussion. So we probably wouldn't have overruled them. But if we go ahead and and it sets up, and then someone on council raises the issue later because there's a significant consequence on that property, do we have legal ground to stand on by changing it mid process without? kind of doing the due diligence that has been suggested it it's it would certainly it would certainly cause an opportunity for for the appearance of risk um, and and just to kind of expand on your question if I may um, you may ask yourself why is why is the city attorney being so timid here and, and I recognize that I am, but in the in the area of land use law, um, particularly as it relates to procedures, um, if you get the procedures wrong, more often than not, the courts will invalidate your actions. That is that is the penalty for getting these types of things wrong, in many many cases. And so that is it, that is where a conservative approach. Is, is 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 I'm forced to adopt is because if you get it wrong a, a court can say no you did it wrong and it doesn't count um, you know, start over or go away or whatever you know the, the result may be and so so that particular um, process would 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 introduce a, an element of risk well for the record I appreciate cautious attorneys because that's why we ask you the questions, so thank you. Further uh, questions or deliberation? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sanders. Uh, yes, uh, 408, uh, a demolition request went aboard, uh, for, excuse me, it's, it's a little late, definitely. Uh, went before the Historic Preservation Commission. They denied it. Uh, we exercised our right of appeal by sending a communication to the city clerk within 30 days. So right now, it, it's standing where uh, we did protect ourselves in being able to appeal their decision. Uh, we thought it was be in the best interest since we don't know if we have to pay the money back, if there's interest in someone else buying it without restrictions of, of green space. There's just sort of too many things going on 
uh, or possibilities to resolve that. So we thought it was best to sort of play it safe and bet on everything happening. And by exercising the uh, the appeal process, that's one avenue that we have to explore down down the way. So we're we're just sitting on it right now. Thank you, Anna. What I said earlier too about if it were a five-five that I would vote no. Uh, I want to change that and say if it were five-five, I would vote yes. If we were able to follow through with um, what Councilman Hussey outlined in far, as far as moving forward with that process of allowing the inclusion of the Quinn Chapel property, and I believe you said that would need to be placed on the informal calendar. So I'm not sure, if Council uh, Councilwoman Ward. Yes, thank you. Um, I think based upon a, what we've heard from the applicants and what we heard from Quinn Ch Chapel um, I would like as uh, the sponsor of the bill to place it on the informal calendar so um, we can look into how Quinn Chapel can be added to the historic district okay so there's been a, the bill has been placed on the informal calendar by the sponsor and uh, Councilman Prather I just want to question I have a question regarding who will be responsible for following up with the interested parties I guess you know does staff feel like they have direction or do, is a is a formal motion necessary to to work that out direction would be great okay <laughs> so I would make them can I make <laughs> yes Councilman I would Hesse. make a motion to ask or to direct staff to come up with a process to add properties to a historic district after the creation of that district I'll second that. Any further discussion? Say it again. Well, the, the motion would be to, to ask them to come up with a process to add properties to a historic district after the creation of said district. After proposed. Well, no, because I think that the path we have to take is that we actually have to create, we have to pass the application in front of us as it stands and then immediately take action to add an additional property which would be the Quinn Chapel property. I don't think based on legal counsel and the process that we actually I think we actually do a disservice to everybody if we just go around and amend it because it sounds like if challenged it's not going to stand up because of all that process but it seems as though we can create some sort of a, a process to add additional properties to a district once it's created. Still doesn't agree. Councilwoman <coughs> Wiseman, <coughs> can we actually do that th at this point, or do we need to recreate all of the work for that to fit in? And do we have enough time to do that while this is on the impromptu calendar? The, the the big challenge and and mr. Barron or mr. Sonny uh, mr. Sanders might be able to speak to this a little more is that as a land use regulation it would have to go through a PNZ process so I don't know how that calendars out but it certainly adds uh, a, a dimension to amend the text um, that would be Councilman it, it, and I guess it would add that I, in an ideal world they line up where they can all happen but it but this gets the ball rolling and it it delays the passage of this to make sure that we work in good faith on that process um, if it requires more time to get that amendment or that 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 process in place to add additional properties to a district after its creation at least we would take a few weeks here to figure out what that looks like and that staff could come back to us at the next council meeting in a public forum or prior to, to to outline what that looks like so that in this instance the Quinn Chapel group you know congregation would have an understanding of what that's going to take and be clear about that process um, before we took action tonight necessarily and then just said trust us on the rest I, I would prefer just to delay a few weeks here work through some of those details and see if we can't uh, prove the good faith side on our, our part as a city council on this effort point of parliamentary order um, 
the motion to um, has the motion to to uh, to put on informal been acted on? I don't think and we need a motion, correct? Can the sponsor as a sponsor just place could, on the informal? Could the could a uh, could the sponsor have alternatively said a uh, table into an indefinite period of time, which have the effect of not having a cl clock tick out? I consulted Robert Rules, uh, which are adopted in the city code. Robert's Rules indicates that a motion to postpone indefinitely effectively kills the, the bill. Follow up. Um, but then you can uh, specify the time for which the bill is recalled. Yes, you can postpone and you can postpone to postpone to a s time certain, which is a, a, a similar but and that time motion. certain could be that time to which. Uh, other actions have occurred I think yeah I don't think it would have to be necessarily a, a, a date certain but upon the happening of, of other events very good and I believe we had a motion but we just needed some clarification and just a comment I believe our informal will probably allow us it's three meetings I believe because it's going to be at least four weeks, you know how how the days run. Our first meeting is not till the sixth of uh, next month, so so that would probably allow us to get to PNZ. I would I would think. No. May I please re retract my motion? <laughs> it, Actually, there's a motion on, motion on the floor, and it, and it, uh, the yeah, maker of the it, motion wish, wishes to withdraw that. No, I will I, in a second. I I would. My understanding would be that there's no need for a retraction tonight. If in three weeks' time at our next meeting we have clarity about that specific date, uh, and it, maybe it's October 1st before we're going to get everything done on this additional process, you could pull it off the floor then and then turn around and make your po your motion to postpone to that specified date okay. at that point in time. But I think the informal takes care of us for this evening okay. from where I sit. I'm happy with that. <coughs> okay. So at this time we have Councilman Hussey's motion. Do we need that repeated? I have it. Okay, Mrs. Donaldson will remind us of that motion. A uh, motion to direct staff to develop a process to add properties after the creation of a historic district. So we have a motion and second and Mr. Kroll. So, so Ryan, just for um, clarification then, if I understand it right, we're going to be coming up with a new procedure, an amended procedure for a pending application. So we'll have a procedure that happens after the fact. That is not the way I understand okay. Mr. Hussey's direction, is that we would dispose of this particular bill, but have in mind a procedure to add already established districts. That's that's what I under, understand Mr. Hussey's okay. uh, motion to contemplate. Yep. My motion, just so I'm clear, it contemplates that the current procedures specify how to create a district. But it seems as though our current procedures might be silent on how you would add a property to said district as time evolved. And so that this direction would say you know this could be any district that gets defined somewhere else in the community of 40 properties and then a few years later there's an, ad an adjacent street that says it makes sense for us to also be a part of this here's our historic quality we don't have a process specifying how those properties would get added mm -hmm. and so that if we can figure out a path to do that through a process that's that I guess that's what I'm directing not to throw everything out and start new Councilman Fitzwater? Just a comment on that. It just seems like an awkward process for something that is so important to our city to be saying, hey, we found a flaw, let's work on it. We move along down the road next time we find a flaw. I mean, you made the comment a little while ago that we had an antiquated process and maybe it's time to look at the entire process and not just piecemeal it because I understood it the same way Mr. Cole did that we were hustling this through so we could take care of this application now I understand it has can be used for future applications but it just seems like we're piecemealing this thing to make it happen that Mr. concerns San me. Mr. Sanders um, 
we were going to put this on the consent agenda, but we had some paperwork issues. Um, we are going to put it on the consent agenda for the August meeting. Uh, we have been uh, notified and we've negotiated with the, the State Historic Preservation Office that we are 98, 99% sure we're going to be getting two historic preservation grants. Um, uh, I alluded to this in an email um, a, a while back, uh, but uh, we are waiting on DNR to give us the paperwork to put on the consent agenda. One of those projects is to develop a historic preservation plan which includes looking at our codes and revising our ordinances. Uh, it involves a lot of public participation. It is a uh, $50,000 project of which $25,000 is the grant money. Uh, we also have identified sources of funds in this year's budget due to uh, employee cost savings that we would use for this grant. Um, we have to be done with the grant, I believe, at the end of August. So hopefully we would, I mean, I'm, I'm just offering a solution to all the issues we have with the code um, but this historic preservation plan would also help set uh, goals and objectives working with the historic preservation commission working with citizens working with council and everybody like that to develop a historic preservation plan which also gives us guidance on ordinances and address these types of issues we have here we applied for this grant i believe last year knowing that we had issues with uh, uh, historic preservation code so I'd like to throw that out as something to consider too I think we could do both we'd be duplicating efforts sure. piecemealing stuff right now and versus later on next year I think this is sort of in a way a short-term benefit and then you, what you're talking is a little more long-term for the future that would require a little more uh, work and in public input and grant approval but this would get us through to solve this situation now and then we'll certainly look at it and evaluate and probably make even more changes so it'd be more streamlined for the future so I, I kind of I would suggest we do both so we have the motion and second any further discussion okay uh, roll call please Fitzwater no Graham aye Hensley aye Hussey aye Kimna aye Mihalovich aye Prather aye Schreiber aye Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. So I think we, we uh, before we move on to item six, we'll take a five minute break. Does that sound good? I do want to thank the uh, Boy Scouts who have sat through this. Um, Got a good lesson. You, you right? Yeah, you get two badges, or maybe, I don't know, three, but you will definitely get your citizen badge if not call the mayor and I will make sure you do but thank you all for being here and uh, a wonderful lesson this evening uh, in city government and we thank all of you for being here and making your commentary and staying this late so thank you we'll take a five minute break thank you, thank you. I know me too me too I'm gonna
six appointments by the mayor. <laughs> Where's my gavel? Call to order. Okay, item six, appointments by the mayor. We have uh, Cultural Arts Commission. Emily Fretwell, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Congratulations, Emily. Item seven, presentations from staff, consultants, and invited guests. There are none. Item eight, announcements by the mayor. I have an announcement. The MR340, sponsored by Missouri American Water, an event where they travel 340 miles of the Missouri River, is coming uh, this Tuesday, uh, July 24th, on the Missouri River out of Kansas City. So they will reach Jefferson City on Wednesday early morning of July 25th. I know that that's always something we enjoy, welcoming the boaters as they come through. They're not called boaters. I, what are they? Madam Mayor? Uh, yes. Where are they going to be at? At Wilson Serenity Point. Down by the what? Oh! <laughs> Carlos! Oh! Carlos! Down by the river! Down by the river in Jeff City Mo. All right, Carlos. <laughs> That's where they're going to be at. Good one. Wow. <laughs> All right, Carlos. We'll see you there. All right. So I cannot be there. If anybody can welcome them that morning, that would be great. On Wednesday, I'm going to Florida to see... Uh, yeah, I'm going to be going to see Rod Stewart in Florida, so I'm busy. If you could be, Carlos is the man. Carlos is going to welcome them down by the river, along with Ken Hussey. And I know that Councilman Mihaljevic is very involved in the river, so I'll expect you to be there uh, as well. So that is Wednesday, the 25th in the morning. Whenever we have a time, usually if we get closer, as they get closer. But I think it's the morning. Steve can let us know. And... Um, that's all my announcements. Oh, and vote in, in August, Tuesday, August, gosh, 7th, thank you. Vote. All right, item, okay, any other announcements? Mr. Sanders. Uh, since I let the cat out of the bag about one possible grant we feel very good about, we have a second historic preservation grant that we applied for. It's to do an ar architectural study down the West Main area. Uh, that'd be a $13,800 grant and we do have the funds uh, gleaned from our personnel budget to match that for about $9,200. So uh, the cat's somewhere running around, but I just thought I'd announce that too since they're both kind of going in tandem. Okay, well, I'm allergic to cats, but that's fine. Okay, we'll get it. We'll, right. we'll, we'll, we'll. so is Carlos. But anyway, thank you. Uh, I have one other announcement, there's a budget meeting um, do you want to announce that one? It's the 23rd? Yes, yeah, starting Monday. Uh, Monday here at, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, 530. Yes, Monday the 23rd at 530, our first budget In meeting. In chambers. Here, yes. yes. Any other announcements? Uh, item 9, Lincoln University. Carolyn was here for about the first three hours. She left. <laughs> Anything from Lincoln? Any announcements at the moment? Um, item 10, presentations from the gallery. Nobody signed up. Item 11, consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion passes. Item 12, bills are reduced 2018-26. An ordinance authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a grant agreement between the city of Jefferson and the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission for assistance with operating expenses for the air traffic control tower at the Jefferson City Memorial Airport for the period of November 1, 2017 through October 31, 2018. Mr. Marash. Thank you. Uh, this grant uh, is through MoDOT. We cover up to 50% of our costs for the contract tower. And that's usually personnel and utilities. You have to answer any questions. No questions. All right. Item 27. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, amending the fares charged by the transit system to include a single day pass. Mr. Marash. Uh, this, this grew out of the uh, trial program we conduct with LU for. Uh, a universal ride pass and uh, to, to complete it uh, to make it ongoing with Lincoln as well as uh, any other interested parties we need to modify the code um, and you have to answer any questions any questions all right thank you bills pending we took up item a so uh, item B number 22 an ordinance of the city of Jefferson Missouri accepting and approving the final subdivision plat of Turtle Creek subdivision section 2 a subdivision of the city of Jefferson Missouri mr. Sanders oh I'm sorry <laughs> yes it is closely associated with the next bill as well okay so 
You're doing both then? You yes. Want to do both. Okay, so the we'll read time. number 23 as well. An ordinance amending section 19-401 streets and highways schedule J parking prohibited subparagraph A of the code of the city of Jefferson, Missouri pertaining to portions of Ronan Court and Ryder Court located in Turtle Creek subdivision. Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This bill would approve the final subdivision plot for Turtle Creek Section 2, uh, Bill Number 22, and then Bill Number 23 would approve the parking plan associated with that. Up on the screen is a location map with the property highlighted. So Section 1 of this subdivision was approved back in 2016 and consisted of 39 lots. There's the developed portion right there, so the air photo does not show that being developed out, but there has since been a number of homes built there. In fact, the subdivision is just about built out. Uh, so the developer is proceeding with section two and the, the, the final phase of the subdivision on the area highlighted on the screen it would consist of 41 lots and uh, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recom recommended approval of this plat at their June 14th meeting on a vote of eight to zero. And then the parking plan associated with the plat is shown up on the screen. Uh, with the uh, sides of the street highlighted in green where parking would be permitted and so the bill would prohibit parking on the opposite side of, of those streets. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? All right, we'll do roll call on 22. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Bill passes. Now we will have roll call on 23. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Bill passes. 24. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with Syntec and Associates for heating, air conditioning, and refrigeration maintenance services. Mr. Marash. Clerk indicated it's a maintenance contract with Syntec. It was bid out and based on past usage. And uh, as you can see, the award is recommended for Syntec. Any questions? Uh, Councilman Hesse? A 20 part question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> I move to adjourn. <laughs> Roll call, please. <laughs> Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Mihalovich? Aye. Prather? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Aye. Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Uh, bill passes. Nothing on the informal. No resolutions. No presentations. No discussion. Is there discussion? Item 18. Any new business? We have item A, Charter Review Advisory Committee Extension. Mr. Mullman. Thank you. Um, Early last week, I distributed to the City Council a staff report which um, uh, sets forth some of the recommended changes that the Charter Review Advisory Committee is uh, going to forward or has forwarded to the City Council. Uh, as part of that staff review, I informed the Council that the um, Charter Review Advisory Committee has uh, asked for a 60-day extension um, to continue to look at uh, just section 6.2 of the charter relating to parks um, I am forwarding, forwarding uh, that request on to the uh, City Council here um, the resolution that established the Charter Review Advisory Committee provides that extensions may be provided by motion so do we have a motion for that extension request Boom. any further discussion uh, do we need roll call probably no. no. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? So motion passes for their extension. <laughs> Item 19, any unfinished business? Item 20, motion to adjourn. Yes. All in favor say aye. aye. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>